assignment twos that have been graded by Daryl are available at the front of you to pick up. Um, so everything in today's class is in the midterm. And there's uh, some, some interesting applications and some examples that you'll get to in today's class and that will all be uh, in the in the exam tomorrow. So uh, just a quick recap here of the cultural filtration. We introduced this last class as, uh, as the method that we're looking at next after microfiltration. The difference here with cultural filtration is that we're running these on asymmetric membranes. There's a very thin layer at the, at the top that's actually doing the work for us um, up at the here. And then these pores, the larger structure, a lot of purely for stability and mechanical integrity. We looked at some applications, and then I just posted a PDF on the course website that uh, is a fairly old article from the 1970s, but it talks about various structural filtration applications. And the nice thing about that article is it goes into the capital costs and the operating costs for those memories. So that's, that's worth reading. We also looked at, at the seeding curve or this uh, rejection coefficient concept in, in the previous class, so I won't go through that again. And we did the uh, end of the class of the last time by talking about the transport phenomena. So we, this is the class today is on the transport phenomena through the ultrafiltration membrane, and we're going to use transport equations then to ultimately design and size the membranes and also look at some interesting ways of configuring membrane circuits. So we're going to look at series and parallel circuits. We're going to look at, uh, at how these are, are, are implemented. And uh, just a note here on this slide that's up right now, this is slide 29. I, uh, I received a request through the evaluations or the course website to uh, number the slides. So you'll see the numbering in the bottom right hand corner. So here's slide 29. There's an important correction that you must make. The, the second last bullet point here calls C subscript F the feed concentration. That is not correct. Um, it is the final concentration. In fact, it's the retentate concentration. The reason for the mix of the terminology is because I'm using about six or seven different books to compile these notes and uh, the terminology, so it's a bit hard to get it consistent. So if you have messed up, um, it's not the feed concentration. This is a very critical notation mistake that I've made here. Please make sure you fix this up. So let's understand what, what, what's gone wrong here and, and what, I, what this notation means. So we say that we've got our membrane down here, the permeate passing through that with uh, some concentration of the solute in that permeate. So usually this concentration of the solute, the protein or the, the particles we're trying to separate, in the permeate is essentially zero. If this membrane is, is got pretty small uh, size, we can safely assume in many of our examples and in our equations where we use this theory that the concentration of the solute in the permeate, which we'll call C subscript P, is zero. So that's a very fair and valid assumption to make. That this membrane is essentially retaining all the solute. So that's the first, first important point that I'd like to emphasize that's not here on the slide. Next, uh, the points that are on the slide, let's just recap those again. We're driving this uh, separation primarily through the pressure difference. That pressure difference is got a, we experience resistance from, resistance from two sources. One is the membrane itself, negligibly small, and for the most part can be ignored. The far st stronger resistance that really affects us is the resistance due to this boundary layer that's building up on the membrane surface. So we call that the concentration polarization effect. Um, in the previous uh, microfiltration, we call that caking. Uh, the literature for ultrafiltration uses this terminology, concentration polarization. Uh, so let's just take a look at what that, what that means is, as this material is coming in uh, through the membrane here, we experience a buildup of solute at that membrane surface. And the concentration right at this membrane wall is extremely high for that solute. As we go further and further into the bulk of the, of the feed stream or of the, of the stream passing through, that concentration decreases. And so I've illustrated that with this horizontal axis over here. And the horizontal axis then represents that concentration. So here essentially it's zero concentration up to this vertical line which represents the concentration in the bulk up here. So at this height y from the membrane surface, we have some form some concentration level. We call that CF. That CF 
is not the feed concentration, as I pointed out already. It is the concentration of the material that will ultimately leave in the retentate. So this bulk stream, you can show from the steady state balance, if I just took a vertical slice over here and did a differential over that, given that I'm shearing material across, you know, the vertical flow, at steady state, my material coming in is equal to my material flowing out, leaving my membrane over here in the retentate stream is going to be a very high or a somewhat high concentration of, of solids CF. So CF refers to my retentate concentration leaving out of the membrane. In the vertical direction as I approach the wall of the membrane, this concentration is going to go higher and higher until I get to some value CW. We don't measure that, we don't know what it is, um, but it, it comes up to some value CW. There is a way to measure it through some experiments that we could, could do. But uh, in general, we don't know CW. Ignore the orange curve for now. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what we said last time is that this equation will hold up here. This equation will hold for, more, for very moderate conditions of very low pressure drops. And that equation is essentially linear. It says as I increase delta P, my flux will increase linearly to J. So J on my Y axis, delta P on my X axis. In this linear region, for increases in the pressure difference, I will get increased fluxes to a point. <coughs> what happens is, as we increase that pressure, we're increasing the thickness of that solids layer building up here closer to the wall. And by doing so, we're increasing that resistance. <coughs> So we're building up the resistance at higher pressures. This curve starts to level off. And here we've illustrated three curves at different velocities. So if we've got higher shearing velocities, we expect to get higher fluxes because we're essentially shear thinning that boundary layer with greater velocities going across it. But if we look at purely at the, at the effect of changing pressure, what happens is that if I go from, say, 15 psi to 20 psi, I'm increasing the pressure, I'm increasing the flux of the solute, the solid particles, towards that boundary layer. So at higher pressures, I'm increasing the flux down towards the membrane surface. But what starts to happen here now is we get a second transport phenomenon taking place. We get diffusion of the solute back into the bulk. So we're building up a high concentration of solids over here. From diffusion, we know that we get building up a concentration gradient. This concentration gradient is going to drive material from higher concentrations to lower concentrations. So there's going to be a counteracting effect due to diffusion in the reverse direction. So we're building up solids here of higher concentration. There's a region over here of lower concentration. There's going to be a diffusion effect in the upward direction over here as well, counteracting that increased rate of solids being deposited on the membrane surface. So these two, well, these two effects are, are, are cancelling each other out. So that's what's written up here. We get diminishing returns as we increase delta P because we, we start to build up a strong concentration gradient and we get diffusion away from the membrane surface due to this concentration gradient. So we can keep increasing delta P, we send more solute towards the membrane, but as we send more solute to the membrane, we're, we're increasing the concentration gradient, which then drives it back again. So at some point, these curves essentially level out, and that linear theory up here breaks down. So what, is it, what does it break down to? I'll come back to these last two bullet points in a minute. Well, so let's, let's derive some equations here to, to see what's going on. Well, We've got our flux going towards our membrane. That's the, the, uh, the J, which is the, the, the volumetric or the permeate flux. If we multiply by the concentration going towards the membrane. That gets us our, our sol rate of solids going to, in the direction of the membrane. Then we have also the rate of the solids leaving the membrane. So we'll call that J such as P times the concentration in the permeate. And because the concentration in the permeate is essentially zero, we're, it's a good assumption to say that this memory retains all the solute. That C permeate is, is zero, so the product of those two terms is zero. But even if C permeate was moderately small, what we essentially have for a membrane, if 
I had to draw this here, this is my membrane surface over here. My flux J over here with, the, with some concentration C coming towards the membrane. And then leaving here, I have my J and then my permeate concentration. But most of my solute is building up against this wall. The net effect is that we can write J is C minus Cp is the net rate of solids going towards the membrane. And I've put the units here so, so that you can work through them. Please make sure that uh, those units are consistent to yourself and you understand uh, what those units are. The most important unit here that's new for us in today's class is the, the term C. It's the concentration of the solids and it's kilograms of solute divided by the volume of solvent. If we multiply that by, uh, by flux J, we essentially get the mass flow of solute towards the membrane. Now let's look at the counteracting effect. We're getting solids going towards the membrane. We've got solids now diffusing away from the membrane according to the standard diffusion equation, where the flux of that solute diffusion is equal to the diffusivity of the solute in the solvent, D such as AB. I've got a term here for dividing through by the density. That's purely to account for the fact that I'm working in volumetric fluxes rather than mass fluxes. So rho F refers to the permeance density. N times dc dy. So the standard diffusion equation of a solute in a solvent is giving me a model for the rate of diffusion away from the membrane. Okay, so this little animation is just a recap of what diffusion is about uh, from mass transfer. I'm not going to go through that. This is this is standard standard terminology. What we can then say is let's equate these at steady state. So if the membrane is operating at steady state, which is as we turn it on, it may take a few hours or minutes to reach that steady state. But as soon as this cake builds up over here on the membrane surface, we're, we're going to build up a constant thickness, a constant layer that's going to resist the um, that's going to resist the mass transfer from the from the pressure difference. We're going to have the, the counteracting effect from the concentration gradient. So that steady state is reached fairly rapidly. And what we can do then is equate the equation for mass flux going towards the membrane with the mass flux away from the membrane. And if we integrate between the limits of the membrane surface, zero, as my distance zero over there in the deep on the bottom of the integral, up to some height LC. So this is some average cake thickness LC. At that point where the cake ends and the bulk begins is also the corresponding concentrations at the wall at zero and then at CF the concentration in the bulk, the concentration that's leaving in the retentate. So integrating that between the limits, notice there's one critical assumption being made here. Anyone see what that is in the integral there? assumption is that we're assuming the diffusivity DAB is constant at all the heights from zero to LC. Okay, that may, may, or not, may or may not be true, but the diffusivity through that, through that boundary layer uh, may, may vary as a function of the heights of the boundary layer, but for, most, uh, for the most parts, we're just lumping it into a single number and saying it's constant. So it's essentially an average diffusivity through the boundary layer of the solute through the solute. So, so that's an important assumption that we're taking this outside the integral, assuming the constant. Straightforward integration then gets us that the, that the log of the that ratio of concentrations is then equal to the flux J, flux of the permeate through the membrane. So that's the rate, the, the meters cubed per meters uh, squared of area per second of permeates leaving the membrane. So flux refers to the permeates uh, flow times the thickness of that boundary layer divided by the diffusivity. And because we don't know that boundary layer thickness, we essentially lump those two terms together, DAB divided by LC, and that becomes our mass transfer coefficient HW. So this then gets us a standard equation here that the flux and the mass transfer coefficient is related to driving forces over here. But here, 
Notice the important thing, the driving forces this time are independent of pressure. We've got no pressure term in that equation, um, and that's, that's expected because we haven't, we started off here with no pressure term. But what we're essentially modeling is the rate against the, going towards the membrane and the, the rate away from the membrane, and that, that comes out in this equation over here with the mass transfer coefficient HW as the now, one thing I will not do is uh, go into how people correlate this mass transfer coefficient into velocities and the Sherwood number and the Reynolds number and the Schmidt number. Though so those standard correlations you've seen in, um, in previous courses can be made to estimate HW. The reason why I don't go into it is because those correlations are in error by as much as 30 to 50 percent. So even if we do use those correlations, we're still going to be fairly far off. My, my approach, and uh, what's generally done as well, is to say, well, let's rather estimate HW through a series of experiments. Because we can measure, um, well, CP we can assume to be zero, CF can be measured, that's the concentration in the, uh, in the retentate, J can easily be measured, it's the flux, and then the only unknown is the concentration at the wall. So we can, we can derive or devise a series of experiments then to estimate HW and CW. Um, through, through the slopes and intercepts, assuming CP to be zero. So this, this uh, uh, the experimental approach is, is far more uh, useful. But the main reason why I derived this equation up here is, is primarily to show that when it simplifies down, we're making a key assumption that CP is zero. Well, it's, it's not a key assumption, but it's, it's, a, it's a fair assumption to make. We get this functional form that the flux J is equal to the is equal to the log times the wall concentration divided by the, the retentate concentration multiplied by the mass transfer coefficient HW. So that structure, that relationship over there is the important part, is that there's a logarithmic relationship between these concentrations and the flux. So let's just uh, quickly come back here to this previous slide. Um, so take this, take this equation here in mind is that it's the log of the wall concentration divided by the bulk concentration over there. <coughs> the point I wanted to make was eventually what happens here is if we increase this, if we're increasing this pressure where we really see no, no change in the pressure, what happens is eventually we go so far that we build up what's called a gel on that membrane surface. If we increase that delta P so high there's a certain concentration that builds up here at this membrane that essentially gels and solidifies that membrane and it, 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 it limits the flux. Beyond that, uh, you can't get any increase in flux. The flux just stays as is. You form essentially a wall of, of, of a boundary of material along that membrane that simply gels there. So at a particular concentration, C subscript G, we get some, some height over there that essentially gels onto that membrane beyond which we cannot improve the flux. So no matter what we do, no matter how much we increase the pressure by, we simply re we remain at that, that concentration at the wall and we remain at a certain flux J. So what, what people do then is they take this equation and uh, simply substitute in the fact that at our wall now, they put in C subscript G, so they put the gel concentration in over there. And that can be determined experimentally. And then you can determine what that limiting flux is through measurement. So you measure the volumetric flow rate for a given membrane surface area. You can then calculate J. CF can be measured. It's the concentration out in the retentate. And then you can back calculate essentially what that, um, that, that mass transfer coefficient is. So the experiments with this theory, with this equation, agree very well. Whereas this previous equa equation that we had up here uh, with the delta P in it, this equation works well for, for moderate pressure drops and is only valid in this, in this area over here. After a certain point, we're operating essentially with this constant gel or boundary layer at the membrane surface. And then this equation with the log in it takes, takes, uh, takes effect. So this equation over here is what's determining our flux through the membrane. And that is the equation that we'll use for ultrafiltration membrane sizing and design.
Because if we take a look at what J is, J is the volumetric flow rate per unit area. CW we can measure from experiments, and then CF we can measure from analytical equipment. That allows us then to size the membrane to achieve a desired flux. So if I'm aiming for a certain flux, I can then figure out the area that I need for that membrane. Because recall that flux is simply the volumetric flow rate divided by the area. Okay, so this is the key equation for ultrafiltration design. Okay, so let's do, do a quick question here. Um, I'd like you to, to work on this for a few minutes. Uh, it should, should take you about five minutes or so. Let's, uh, let's just take a look at what, what this question is asking. We're looking at an ultrafiltration application. Um, and we're, we're treating a waste stream that has half a kilogram per, per, per meter cube of waste. So that's my solids concentration in my, in my feed. In the slides that you may have originally, you've got 0.5 grams per liter. It's the same thing. So 0.5 kilograms per meter cubed. The desired solute concentration coming out of the membrane is 20 kilograms per meter cubed. So we're looking at concentrating out that feed of 5.5 kilograms per meter cubed. We want to thicken up that feed to 20 kilograms per meter cubed. So reduce the, the, the volume, uh, increase the concentration of that, of that feed. The flux then through this pilot plant study is given by this structural equation that we've seen now where there's a mass transfer coefficient HW of 0.02 multiplied by the log of the wall concentration divided by the intensity and that equation is given in the volumetric form. So this, uh, this more correctly, I should have written here JV. This is meters cubed per meter second uh, per hour. Now, due to fouling, the flux from this membrane never exceeds 0 0.05 meters cubed per hour per meter squared. So that's, in other words, our limiting flux. What is the limiting final concentration CF? And what is the interpretation of it? So at the limiting flux, solve for the limiting concentration, what is, what is the meaning of that, that limiting concentration? So this is important to understand what that interprets, what this equation gives us for, for the, um, when we're limited by the flux.
mistake at that it's not kilograms cubed, it's kilograms per meter cubed. So we've calculated a, a, the limiting flux. The interpretation that I'm asking here is what, is, what does that value mean? What if you had uh, that, sorry, that limiting concentration? What if you had a concentration higher than that or lower than that? Uh, does, what, where does the limit, this limit come from? Or where, where would we get up into this? But this number is 
and it's, they're far away for sure, but is it a problem that I'm higher or is it a problem that I'm lower than that limit? Lower. Definitely it's a problem if, you, if your desired concentration is lower than the limit. If your desired concentration is above this limit, you've got no problem. That's the, the key, key interpretation of that is that this setting is setting a lower bound on your concentration. The fact that we want a higher concentration out here is okay. <coughs> yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to be I'm not going to meet that flux limitation. And the, the way you can see that is to uh, substitute our <coughs> desired concentration in here. Um, so you then you say you do it two times a lot of 25 divided by 20. Through this and follows a, follows a path 
uh, winding up to the, to the top. This is, is very much always in lamina flow. And there's a, there's a pressure difference that would, would drive the permeate into this membrane and, uh, and takes, takes it out through, through, through those channels. So this is generally run in batch mode and then it's cleaned out periodically because of the lamina flow. We don't get to shear off the solids uh, building up on the wall. But the, more, the two most widely used membranes are these two, the spiral bound and the hollow fiber membranes. The, uh, these will be almost always the ones that you see in practice. And the main reason for that is because you get an incredibly high surface area per unit volume of the installed uh, membrane. So here, we're, uh, Hank described the process here. You essentially take your membrane that's folded up as an envelope so the sides of the membrane are sealed. And then the salt, the, the, the feed is, is, is fed in through these spaces that are um, so interleaved in between each of the membrane layers. There's a spacer layer. And so the feed will actually come in through that spacer layer and then permeate into the membrane, uh, which is then folded up like, uh, like an envelope, as Hank said. And the, in fact, the permeate will, will spiral through the, through the entire membrane to the central core, where it's then removed as the, as, as the permeate. Uh, actually, in this illustration, it's removed from this side, and the retentate is, is removed from the other side. What will happen is they, they will uh, roll these up in, in one meter long uh, sections, and then there'll be one of these and then another one in series afterwards. So there'll be about five or six, and they'll pack all five or six into a single coherent tube. So you'll uh, we'll get some of these long tubular type membranes. So essentially, in series, you've got a few of these. Uh, back to back. The hollow fiber membranes are there about in the order of 3,000 little hollow fibers put into this uh, into, a, into a tube. And um, the material that you're trying to, to separate will be fed into the middle of the of the, each of those hollow fibers for ultrafiltration. For reverse osmosis we tend to feed the material on the outside of the hollow tube and it will permeate into the into the hollow tube. And that's purely because for, uh, for pressure differences, the pressure differences are higher there and um, you can retain the structural integrity of it. But at ultra filtration, these little tubes are able to handle the pressure gradients and the feed is fed from the inside and, and permeates out. Uh, so there's an example of, of, of another hollow tube and there's an example of one of the fibers itself. Uh, so there you can see the very the asymmetric layer over there in the interior and then the, the outer layer of the structural support. The in, typical inside diameter of one of those fibers is in the order of uh, 500 to 1,000 microns for, for ultra protection. So that just gives you uh, a bit of a sense of, of these geometries. There's um, a number of ways that we can sequence these units. And so we'll take a look at one of them and, and do an example on the board here. Uh, we can sequence them in parallel. So we essentially take our feed and, and split it uh, in, in, through multiple membranes. So this just allows us to get multiple, uh, uh, higher throughput essentially. Then we collect those permeate streams together and we collect our retentate streams together. Um, so this, that's the expected manner and it's used in most, most installations. What, what can sometimes be done as well is you can sequence them up in series. This is when a single membrane by itself does not get you the required concentration you're looking for. So you, you then follow it up with the second one or the third or fourth as well. But the problem here with doing this is that you need to have intermediate uh, pumping capability to handle those, those pressure drops. Because you, you never recover your pressure that you've put into the system. Unlike other separating systems, you can often recover your energy separating agent with membranes uh, that pressure drop once we've spent it, we, we can never recover it. So uh, we have to have intermediate uh, pumping capability to keep going with that pressure drop. So what will happen here is that this, uh, this feed will be at low concentration, the intermediate concentration over here will be somewhat higher, and we build up that concentration as we go through the series circuit. So in fact, the last membrane is seeing the greatest concentration of, of feed material and is the membrane that's most prone to fouling. Uh, the earlier membranes are less and less prone to fouling. So it's the later ones that actually do more, more and more of the work for you in the series setting. Here's an example of an island in the in Greece area, or so Cyprus area. Um, they use this pure 
for desalination, salt water reverse osmosis, or SWRO, salt water reverse osmosis. We'll talk about this uh, next week. This is purely um, this is the big installation to handle all this, all this water treatment is because they're an island and they're surrounded by oceans, so they have no fresh water desalination. And then these units here um, would be linked up both in series internally. So internally there would be a number of series units and then in parallel we see this header feed come out here and split up to the multiple membrane units. So, so there's parallel externally and then series internally to each one of these cheaper units. talk a little bit about the mode of operation. We'll usually run these in continuous mode. Um, it, it's, it's cheaper and more cost effective, but for biological operation, for pharmaceuticals and bacteria, um, where you, your biological separation is going to be used as a drug later on, from regulatory requirements, they do require batch operation, purely to isolate, um, isolate uh, off-spec materials and we can sort of process coherently and if there's ever a recall, they can recall an entire lot and, and, and be able to isolate. Whereas with continuous operation, you tend to bleed everything together into one mixture. You can't uh, separate them out. So biological, uh, just due to regulatory requirements that operate as a batch mode, but it is actually inefficient. Um, if there's a high solids concentration in your feed, uh, one of the issues there is we see with high solids concentration coming in, you're going to start to plug up your membrane. Uh, so you need to dilute, dilute your incoming feed. And one way to do that is to simply recycle your permeate back again uh, to, to, dilute, to dilute your incoming strength. Okay, but what I wanted to start to talk about uh, here in an example with you is to look at, at, at how this would work then. If you were setting up your, your um, material, you, we would typically start in batch mode where we feed our tank and we pass it through the membrane and we have our permeate leaving. But what we do is we close this valve up here for the retentate and we recycle that retentate around. So just until we get to to some sort of steady state flux and some steady state buildup of material along that membrane surface. That would happen then and we would open, open that valve for the retentate and we would then bleed off, bleed off our, our final concentrated product of interest. So this is called the feed plus bleed type setup. It's a very standard, uh, standard setup. And what's then done often is that that retentate may not be at the concentration that's desired so it will go to another P plus P lead unit. So we'll sequence up uh, these in series. So this is the first P plus P lead step. And uh, what I wanted to do was uh, this example where we take a look at modeling that P plus P lead step and introduce some of the notation around that flow sheet. So it's the same quantity as before, except this time we're looking at, at what's leaving that P plus P lead surface. Uh, put up here what we know. 
what's given to us is that Q0 is the volumetric flow rate, C0 is that value of 0.5 kilograms per meters cubed, so that's our concentration. So we know our incoming stream, Q0, is 50 meters cubed per day. And then we're told we're operating units for 20 hours per day, so we multiply, uh, oh, sorry, divide by 20 hours per day that we're operating a unit for, that comes up to the 2.5 meters cubed per hour, is that incoming flow rate. The incoming concentration we're given directly as 0.5 kilograms per meter cubed. And what we can do is uh, we do a mass balance for the, for the solids over that boundary. So Q0 times C0, that's the meters cubed coming in per hour multiplied by kilograms per meters cubed. This gets us our mass flow per hour coming in is equal to the mass flow leaving in the permeate QP times CP plus the mass flow leaving in the retentate. QR times CR. But as we said, it's a safe assumption to assume CP is equal to zero. So we're essentially have no solids leaving in our permeate. So this is it's a clean stream of solvent sol sol only. So this reduces down to Q0 times C0 is QR times CR. Well, we know what CR is. CR is our desired uh, concentration that we're looking for. The desired solute concentration must be 20 kilograms per meter cubed. So that's CR is 20 kilograms per meter cubed. So in this equation over here, we know Q0, we know C0, we know uh, CR, we can calculate them for QR. This is the volumetric flow rate of this retentate of that lead stream. If you look at your, at your diagram that you have in the notes here on the previous slide, that's the bleed that's coming off from the retentate stream. So this is our bleed that we get. <coughs> the volumetric flow rate of QR then is 25, I'm sorry, 2.5 times 0.5 divided by 20, which can get you 0.0625. So if we're coming in at 2.5 meters cubed per hour in the feed, this QR, this flow, volumetric flow rate of the lead stream, very, very small, 0 0.0625 meters cubed per hour coming out of the lead content. Very, very slow flow rate, but very high concentration. Our solids concentration is 20 kilograms per meters cubed, but the volumetric flow rate 0 0.0625. Then the next step to do is, is a volume balance. So a volume balance over that same boundary would give you Q0, the incoming volumetric flow rate, is equal to the retentate QR plus the permeate flow rate, QP. So we can solve this for QP then. Gets you 2.43. Seven five meters per hour. So very high flow rate of the permeate. So we've got two point five meters cubed coming in, two point four three of it leaving in our permeate with no solids. Then a very low uh, flow rate here in the retentate to that bleed of 0 0.06, but a very high concentration of solids in it. So, so that makes sense from what this membrane's objective is. But the question that we're after here is how many membrane modules do we require if each module is 30 meters squared? So the way we solve that is to recognize simply that this QP is the volumetric flow rate divided by the area is equal to the flux J. So QP is your is your retentate, uh, sorry, your permeate flow rate, that's your flux. Uh, 
times the area. So QP is JB times A. Or QP divided by A is essentially the definition of the flux. And that's 0 0.02 times the log of 25 divided by this term CF. CF is the concentration of the solids leaving in the bulk. That's, in other words, CF was the notation we used earlier when we derived that, but on this uh, example here, CF would be the equivalent of CR. It's the concentration of the material leaving in your retentate. So I should be substituting in CR over here. So I can now solve this equation for A because I know, uh, I know QP and I know CR. I've calculated CR up here. Oh, sorry, CR is given, I should say CR is the, uh, the desired outlet concentration. And solving that then for A gets you 546 meters squared of surface area required. And then we can then calculate the number of membrane modules needed. So if we go 30 meters squared uh, per, per module, we would need 18.2 uh, modules. Take it up next class and make sure that we understand the